webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, how to keep up with the new insurance customer. Um, we'd like to say a really quick thank you to Reuters Events for putting to the, uh, together today's event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, Chris Frankland, founder of InsureTech360, um, Chief Innovation Officer with Carebridge International. I'm a global thought leader, mentor to startups, and spent my entire career building products and solutions that leverage people, process, technology, and data to reimagine the insurance and customer experience. So for that reason, um, delighted to be part of today's panel. It's a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, last week, I co-chaired the Reuters Insurance AI and Innovative Tech event in Chicago, a wonderful event. Um, but one of the key themes to come out of that was how can we leverage technology and innovation to not only meet the needs of existing customers, but also do a better job at engaging with uh, folks out there who are either uninsured or underinsured. Um, one of, for me, one of the standout quotes from that week uh, was from uh, Raul Nanduri, the chief claims architect at AIG, um, who stated, know your customer before they become your customer. Um, so as the industry continues to shift towards a predictive and, and more proactive stance, um, really we're, we, 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 we're trying to do a better job at understanding what those customer needs are uh, before they, they actually walk through the door. So um, I'm, I'm delighted to be joined today by three terrific guests who undoubtedly will, will share their thoughts um, and, and expertise and experience on all of the above. So uh, I'd like to welcome and say a big hello to Mark Hardy, VP Direct Life and Health at TD Insurance, Laura Doddington, the SVP and Managing Director, uh, Director Consumer at um, Aviva Canada, and Carrie Watson, Senior VP Marketing and Customer Experience with Westland um, Insurance. So welcome all of you, thank you for joining us. Um, and to kick things off, I would like to kind of give you the opportunity perhaps to introduce yourselves and uh, share your thoughts about today's session. So Carrie, why don't we, why don't we kick things off with you? Thanks so much, Chris. I'm really pleased to be here today to share some thoughts and also hear from Mark and Laura on this topic. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Client Experience at Westland Insurance. I've worked in the insurance industry for 20 years now, first on the carrier side and now in a national brokerage. So really excited to be closer to the, the consumer and the customer as part of the, the brokerage side of the business. Westland Insurance is a brokerage with 200 locations across Canada, selling personal lines, commercial lines, and group insurance products. We also own an, a national MGA called Agile Underwriting Solutions and two digital brokerage brands, New Era and Zipshire. So just for a little bit of context for, for those participating um, on the call today. Uh, my role at Westland is to lead our client experience strategy and execution, as well as our Westland insurance digital sales teams and our marketing and communications teams. And in, in terms of the topic today, um, first of all, I just wanted to highlight what hasn't changed in the insurance industry, which is really the importance of trust in consumers choosing their insurance um, provider. It's still a key factor in how, in how clients choose their insurance provider, but the ways that trust is established have really evolved to include more digital proof points, as well as demonstrating a deep understanding of the client as an individual. So I know we'll get into that a little bit more today. Um, and uh, just in terms of Chris, I was happy to hear you uh, introduce the quote because I was expecting to do so myself as well. I, I recently read a Majesco report and there was a line from there that I thought was um, really great as a, a thought starter, is that the next generation of buyers is here today. The older generation has accelerated their adoption of digital, increasing their expectations as well. So it's not just young people that are interested in digital delivery and really expecting that. And that insurance providers must quickly update their mindsets their processes and their technology or risk being left behind in a state of irrelevance. Um, so just, um, I think, you know, a, a bit of a motivator and, and certainly exploring the topics we have today. And for some additional context, um, millennials have now overtaken Gen X and boomers generationally as our primary insurance buyers. So really thinking of who our um, insurance consumer is, I think requires a little bit of a shift to that. And they'll be joined in three years by Gen Z. And of course, the millennials and Gen Z have grown up with technology. They expect um, digital technologies to really deliver personalized services. And they're willing to pay for additional insurance if it makes sense for them. But they definitely don't want to pay for features that they don't personally need. 
They expect their providers are able to access data from a number of sources to truly understand them as an individual and to make that experience easy through the policy lifecycle, including their Internet of Things devices. And through the pandemic, I think we, we did see uh, an acceleration of digital adoption for all generations, with younger generations really expecting those intuitive and comprehensive online insurance experiences. And at the same time, still um, really valuing the advice and personal touch of a human advisor. And uh, I think that's true for all generations. Um, insurance isn't the most exciting thing to figure out yourself. And so that trust of, of having an advisor to lead you through that when you need that type of service is really important. And, and I know the research shows that that really is the preference for purchasing a new policy, making a complex change to a policy, resolving questions, reporting a serious claim and resolving billing questions, but really a preference toward the digital side of delivery for researching insurance in particular, getting quotes, accessing your documents, making payments, making simple changes, submitting minor claims, those things that have really become very common um, from, from other industries, consumers are really looking for that and looking for their insurance um, providers to deliver on that today. Brilliant, Kerry, thank you so much. Um, some, some, some great thoughts there. And uh, undoubtedly we'll, we'll, we'll be diving into those um, as we uh, proceed through today's uh, uh, session. Um, just, just a really quick reminder to, to folks listening, um, please, please get your questions in. Um, so we, 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 we have a chance uh, for, for this terrific group to share their uh, knowledge and expertise. Um, so get, 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 get those questions in when you can. Um, Laura, over to you. Hello. Great. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, so as you mentioned in the introduction, um, I, uh, I'm part of Aviva Canada and I run the Aviva Direct business within Canada. Um, I guess just a, a little bit about my background, I'm, I'm an actuary by training and one of the things that I really like doing is taking that, that kind of data, data science aspect and bringing it to a whole business and saying like actually it's not just about thinking about data in a narrow field but thinking how do we use that and take, think about data insights across the business as a whole. Um, so just to say a little bit about Aviva Direct, we sell uh, home and auto insurance in Canada and we sell it direct to consumers. And we really have a focus around digital. So who are those customers who want to do things digitally? Um, I will say it's a work in progress. So I don't want to stand here today and say Aviva Direct Canadian digital experience is exactly where we want it to be. It's a work in progress, but we really recognize the importance of that. Um, and that's that's a big focus for us right now. Um, for me, it's very, um, it's very pertinent because you can tell from my accent, I come from the UK and I remember 15 years ago, I think I bought my my first auto insurance policy online in the UK and so I know you know I've seen, seen some of that and we're starting to see more of those trends I think happen in North America and um, so you said in the in the introduction to this into, to this call digital is the future and it's interesting I think even just if I just go a few years back in Canada in some of those conversations so digital is the future and you'd get yeah, but is it really, made? maybe it's niche or yeah, but can you really give advice digitally or yeah, but isn't digital just for millennials anyway, right, um, was one of my favourites and and Carrie, you touched on that, you know, I think people think, of, talk about, oh yeah, but it's, it's just millennials, like millennials just turned 40, this is not a niche market anymore, it's not, it's not even very young, um, so I think, you know, ignoring that and ignoring those trends is, is really an, a mistake for the industry and really important that we start thinking of thinking about what those customers want and, and frankly expect these days. Um, COVID certainly accelerated um, a lot of the trends that we were already seeing. You know, even if I think outside of insurance, my own purchasing behaviours, probably your own purchasing behaviours, I think have changed through COVID. People are increasingly wanting to do things digitally, increasingly wanting to get really fast responses from those organisations. We've become more impatient, I think, in terms of reactions. Like one of my there are lots of bad things about the pandemic, but one of the perks is that I can order beer online and it's at my door the next day, right? So that kind of being able to do those things quickly, I think has really changed customer expectations. And I think there's actually a big gap in what insurance providers, and I include myself in this, what insurance providers are providing to consumers today. So we really need to think about that. There is a lot to do on digital. I think though that it's, it's, an error if we think about digital as just technology. Um, you can build some a great technology platform 
and if it doesn't meet customer needs, then you really haven't solved what it is that we need to solve for. So I think when we think about digital, it is much broader than building some technology platform that people can go on. It's really about a wholesale change in the way that we think about insurance and the way we think about customers. And digital gives us opportunities to build outstanding um, customer experiences. So embedding that data into digital, using that to enhance the, the experience for customers, I think is absolutely critical. When we think about digital, I think um, it's a great opportunity to think about the way that we do everything and change it and encourage ourselves to challenge the status quo. Um, so I talk about that with my team a lot, just because we did something 20 years ago. If we now just digitize that thing, it doesn't make it any better. How do we actually challenge what we've been doing and really make it better for customers? Um, that might mean changing the way that we think about design and thinking customers first. Uh, digital gives us way more access to data than we've ever be, ever had before. So using that data to help improve what we're doing for customers. Thinking about how we even organizationally design and think about that org design and the way that that is supporting customers and supporting digital experiences. I think there's a lot of opportunity here um, as we think about digital as organizations to change the way that we do things as well and to make it better for the customers that, we, that we're serving. Um, so I'm excited. I think um, we're at the start of something exciting as an industry and I think we're gonna see a lot more change over the next few years. And, and if we as an industry embrace it, I think we can do some great things. Laura, thank you so much. Um, some 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 terrific uh, points there, which which if I forget to come back to them, please please remind me because I you know I I, I certainly think um, and and completely agree um, the way that we we've, we've done things before. Um, we, we we have a unique opportunity, I think, through through data and technology to 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 truly reimagine what 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 that traditional experience has has been. And you know I I talk a lot about customer journey mapping, design thinking, you know, methodologies that, 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 that help us think perhaps a little bit beyond those, those, those traditional lines. So definitely want to come back to that with you and, and, and the group and, and kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, last but not least, Mark, hello. Oh, hello thanks you. and uh, welcome to, yeah, no, so, so glad to hear from uh, Carrie and Laura already and so many good uh, points to, to build off of. I, I did, and to your point, Chris, so first I'll introduce myself. So Mark Hardy um, on the TD insurance side and, and focused on the implementation of digital life insurance. So uh, direct to consumer digital purchase of life insurance and one that you might not traditionally think of as a uh, category that's easy to do digital, but certainly one we've seen a tremendous movement focusing on the customer I think is really the big so you think I think that the different um, of focusing on the customer and say when you pivot your perspective to say we're designing things for uh, the customer that's where the things like one size does not fit all digital the reason you're doing digital yes it makes sense it's good for carriers but the the drive wasn't from carriers out and from providers out it was from customers in demanding that we move in that way um, and even data informed decisions. It's the, the customer is driving the industry. And so the opportunity for us is we know where customers are going because they're in other places first. And so that's where we can start to lead our way forward. So that was maybe one thing is, is the customer element of it. Um, and then the second one, which I think is critical in making sure that we're successful in digital, in being personalized and leveraging data is, you got to, and, and Laura, I think you both touched on this, is the culture. Right. So do you have the approach, the people, are you willing to throw out not your, your 20 year old dogma on certain things, your process that's always worked, but are you equally willing to say, I implemented this new thing last year. It was wonderful. It's tremendously successful. And now I need to basically burn it to the ground and start over because the expectations are moving that quickly. So how do we set an environment that creates that culture that continues to deliver in that? Um, and, and I really like the way that it was framed as a question around data informed decisions. Um, I know the sort of, we talk about data driven or, or data only type things. The, the real value of having that culture and the teams and that customer perspective is to use data and then apply the insights with the human element of it, right? So you, you, you talked about design thinking and those customer processes. I think you, you, 
where we add value and because of the category, it's one where we definitely need to layer on not just the, that we certainly need to look at the data and what it's telling you from a customer standpoint, but you need to overlay um, some of that human insight into it to really deliver again to that customer expectation, which is where they're where they're driving us to. Um, and I, I, all these things are super important. And then and the principle of what we're trying to achieve is deliver protection. So whatever the product category is, like the purpose in, in insurance, the reason I mean for myself for sure is is the passion is it. Can you deliver more protection? Can you do it to folks who wouldn't necessarily otherwise get it? Can you do it in a way that continues to um, uh, deliver value? And, and so I think you know the things we're talking about: data, digital, the personalization, the ability to do that at scale, deliver value. They're all ultimately around making sure that we're taking care of of that end end customer in the way that they want. Superb. Cheers, Mark. Um, yeah, that, that's 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 a terrific way to kind of wrap up those 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 thoughts. Um, thinking about obviously, um, you know, how do you deliver value? Um, and perhaps you know, you mentioned the value, but also the accuracy, right? Using data to deliver um, a product and 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 cover that that that's that's accurate, um, which which obviously impacts the whole journey. Um, so keep keep those questions coming. Um, data. I'd like to kind of kick off with you know, thinking about the data component. Um, you know, you 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 all made kind of uh, uh, observations about where, where data um, plays a role in this journey. Um, and I, I I read a really in interesting fact last last week. By 2025, um, global data creation is projected to be or move or, or grow to 180 zettabytes. Um, I'm a tech guy. I wasn't entirely sure what a zettabyte was, but uh, to, to, uh, a zettabyte is, is, is the equivalent of a trillion uh, gigabytes. So um, just just enormous, enormous number um, that, that, you know, we, we are we, we are collecting obviously more data than ever before, um, you know, but I'd like to throw a question out there, um, you know, what do you, I mean, how do you, how do you each kind of see data being used in a way that that can inform customer related decisions and, and, and really create a better digital experience, create, create products that are more tailored and perhaps personalized to the, um, to the insured and perhaps thinking about that customer before they become the customer. Um, uh, Mark, I'll, I'll throw that out to you since, since you, you're, you're up there on the screen as well. No, no, thanks. And, and um, so I, uh, just sort of to reiterate, like I think on the on the data front and customers and being able to to deliver um, drive insight and even she said like the quantity of data. I think where um, the important piece is actually to say okay, which data is important in the process and and so there's methods of doing that, right? So we, we obviously machine learning and, and the AI elements and, and sort of distilling all of that are certainly there. Um, where we've seen really good success is actually saying, okay, what are the what are the first steps? Which are like, what does the data tell you? Obviously, right in front of yourself, um, can you then deploy something that tests that to prove it? And then, if it's true, that's good. If it isn't, you need to get more customer insight as to like, what's the what's the difference between what I'm seeing in my data, what I think in my sort of group of of people who are thinking about the problem and the reality. Um, so I think data and collection is important. The, the insights are important, but the process of how you execute and turn them into something meaningful. Mm. Um, so it's about designing the experiment to deliver the change in the metric. And so you've got to be sort of cognizant of, of those pieces. So I think that's maybe the, the highlight I would make on, on that piece. Um, and just the last nuance to it, you know, lucky to be in a direct space where we get tremendous amounts of verbatim and other customer feedback, right? So um, you, you would refer to it like canary in the coal mine type stuff, but I, you know, over index on, if I have a customer verbatim, there's a lot of meaning to that because there's a lot more people who have that experience trying to get those customer inputs as much as possible and valuing them for the gold that they are it is as important as the aggregate big data stuff that sort of tells you sort of functionally where you're gonna go, those add a lot of value. Yeah, thank you. Cheers, Mark. And 
Laura, as the as the kind of actuary here, um, you know, this this is this is your moment to shine. Uh, but you know, you 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 talked a lot about kind of perhaps these different customer profile segments that we we need to deliver. Um, you know, a, a a consistent, exceptional customer experience, not just not just for for, for the younger folks out there, but perhaps the millennials, the the, the uh, everybody. Um, how do we do that? Yeah, so I think there's a few different aspects to this. You know, I think it's um, one of the first pieces is actually, are you capturing the right data? So it can be really easy for everyone to say like, yes, I really want to use data and so on. But actually, if you don't build that into your design in the first place, you won't have the data that you want. So, you know, if you want to, for example, understand how people are going through your website, you have to build that in and you have to build the tracking in, right? And if you don't do that, then the rest of it, you're not going to be able to use. So I think it's really important to think, data first in those builds as well as the using the data when you've got good data i think there's a few different there's a few aspects to it one of the things i think that's really important and I, I briefly touched on on organizational change one of the things that i think needs to change for organizations is to be thinking much more cross-functionally mm -hmm. because i think one of the things that we've done in the past is we've used data in actuarial we've used data in data science we've used data in marketing we've used data in our ops teams but we're not thinking about the data for that customer end-to-end -end. Yeah. And so I think bringing that full end to end customer lens with data and everybody using the same data consistently to talk in the same language, I think is really important because once you start doing that, I think that's when you start to unleash the power of the data, because now if your marketing team is thinking about data and customers and customer needs the same way as your digital teams, the same way as your pricing teams, that's where you can really start to build those great experiences. Um, so using data as a consistent language across teams, I think, is really important. Um, and then that can start to help you build those great customer experiences. Yeah, thank you. That's that's such a great um, observation. And, you know, I think that that, that yeah, last week that was also a, a, a theme that, that came up in one of the fireside chats that I did with um, uh, um, Catherine. Um, um, so yeah, but yeah, thinking about the the the, the cross-functional team component, right? I mean that that that, that is critical. Um, you know, Carrie, love to get your your thoughts on that because you know when you're trying to build this customer three hundred and sixty um, uh, uh, perspective, um, you know, having having buy-in from across the org and, and kind of having that that consistent approach is is critical, right? Absolutely, uh, and I absolutely agree with with Mark and Laura on on all of those points in terms of knowing which data you want to capture and what you'd like to do with it, and then really being able to drive those insights and socialize them across the organization so that everyone's working with a common understanding that's, that's rooted in data of what clients are really looking for. And of course, there's no one statement to make on that because of the individualization of, of client needs as well. So um, I think the opportunity there is to really um, marry that data and look at um, journey analytics across the, the client life cycle and what are clients actually doing? What factors are predictive of what they're about to do next? And being able to um, use A-B testing to, to test that out in real life in terms of what interventions might, might influence retaining the client or increasing sales or um, improving loyalty, improving referrals, those types of things. So the the merge of data and digital technologies together really provides a, a pretty exciting laboratory to, to test it in real life, what um, not only what clients say, but what clients actually do, and to be able to add value to that journey, um, not only in automated workflows or digital interfaces, but also to help our um, employees that are interacting with clients to, mm -hmm. to have a, a really effective intervention or to have more uh, context for uh, about the client that they can utilize to really build relationships, build that trust, and uh, so I think even in the in the well, maybe not even, especially in the human interaction, uh, being able to really leverage that data, leverage those insights, and make them available to uh, people across the organization so that they can can use that in their work and in in their day to day interactions is a really powerful way to. Um, to increase the, the feeling that the client has of that, that kind of individualized service and that it can inform the product recommendations that that advisor or um, digital interface is making to the client as well. 
Yeah, cheers, Carrie. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned the um, kind of the the employee, the, 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 the internal customer, right? Because as much as we talk about customer experience in terms of the, the external um, facing uh, uh, customers, we, we, we have our own internal customers that, uh, Laura, you, 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 meant, you, know, you, you talked about um, the past two years and COVID and perhaps the impact that's had on, on all of our lives. And I think if, if anything, um, folks working within the industry are, are increasingly perhaps doing more, more with less, um, you know, juggling more things, you know, kind of trying to balance work, life, um, pressures, uh, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the needs, the, the urgency to, to build and develop tools that perhaps make um, our, uh, uh, you know, CSRs, advisors, um, uh, you know, folks within the insurance space, you know, help them work work more effectively and, and perhaps do their job a little bit better. Um, so, Carrie, you mentioned that kind of, you know, the, 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 the perhaps finding this balance between digital technology and 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 the human um, element as well. Um, I, I talk about this a lot, really, and, and I think it's it's a bit of a struggle. You know, there, there, there's with with innovation and technology, there's perhaps a tendency to throw technology at everything and try to solve all of the problems, you know, with 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 a chatbot. Whereas, you know, obviously there's still a, a critical role for people in the industry um, and, and that human component. How do, you know, how, how, how do insurers find that balance? You know, how do you kind of find that balance between um, empathy perhaps with with people and technology and, and, and just a pure, a pure technology play? I'll, I'll let you kind of yeah, I'm sure, there. absolutely. Uh, I think it goes back to what uh, Laura and Mark have been really touching on is understanding the, the client and what they're looking for in different scenarios. And then um, I think, you know, skewing one way or the other in your design, but also providing options. I, I really feel like that's the most important piece. So in your example with the chatbot, making sure that there's also a, a live chat outlet for when the chatbot mm -hmm. doesn't work or, um, you know, when you're... Uh, when you have a digital experience, maybe that's the, the primary experience that you're intending to deliver because you know that that tends to suit most, most client interactions, let's say for filing a claim, but also making that phone number really obvious and available and making sure that the teams that are supporting answering the phone are well informed and can pick up in context what's already happened in the digital interaction. So really that, that omni-channel delivery of understanding the context of what's already happened in terms of that client's interaction with us? What have they done on our website through our chat? Uh, what have they done last week when they phoned in and they were upset? So that when they when they do get to a, a human interaction, that, that individual is really prepared to um, address the, the technical need, but also understands the emotional need. And um, one of the things I'm really passionate about is to um, work on serving up guided workflows so that our advisors um, have that, that guidance. They don't have to each um, sort of make that up in the moment or um, have been a broker for 10 years to understand the nuances of what that conversation should look like. So really helping employees be confident and capable very quickly through guided workflows and some of those data-driven prompts. I think it's a really powerful way to to kind of blend the two. I don't know if I really answered your question, Chris, but you can tell I tried to get it. No, <laughs> no, I, one of the things that I'm really passionate about in terms of employee enablement of the client experience. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, 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 I think you did answer it perfectly, um, Kerry. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I think part of it is trying to kind of embed that 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 seamless handoff right between between tech and 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 the person you know it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other continuously it could be this kind of ad hoc dynamic um relationship between technology and and and, and people right I, I really feel like it gives employees superpowers if you can can marry the two and really focus on some of those internal uses of digital and data to um to yeah. give employees all that, all the insights that they need to uh, be able to really connect with the consumer or the client and, and to be able to deliver what they're looking for in the moment. Completely agree. Um, Laura, anything, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree with Carrie. I think she made some great points there. I think, you know, one of the things that we've done in our direct business pools, so actually in our um, broker business where we're um, looking to, to help our brokers and deliver great service there is really look at what are the things where, whether it's our own customers or whether it's brokers 
they're using um, non-digital solutions. So they're phoning us up and they're, and they're asking, and when are we adding value in those interactions versus when are they doing it because, act, because our digital solution wasn't good enough and we could have made it better and they're frustrated that they're calling right. And I think that's a great opportunity to try and see like, if it's a phone call because that was absolutely the best thing for that customer or that broker or whoever it might be at that moment, that's great. Like that phone call needs to be there and that's what they need. If it's a phone call because we didn't explain it well, they didn't understand what we were doing, our portal was hard to use, that's not good and that's not value add. And then we should focus on those fixes to remove some of that so that the people who are on the phone are adding value to that customer at that moment. And so I think that can be a good way of, of thinking about digital versus non-digital as well. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. I think that's actually great advice for people out there who, who are trying to perhaps figure out their own uh, respective customer journeys. I mean, kind of look at you know try to learn from from how things are done now you know where things perhaps do not work as well as they should and then and then apply apply the technology or apply the solution um mark would love to get your thoughts on, on this yeah no so it, uh, again to uh, agree across the board on all of those i think maybe the the ad piece would be around um with anything that's technology driven i love carry the way you're thinking about like the guided workflows and how that can help people be successful the, like turning the customer focus towards colleagues because colleagues are ultimately delivering the customer experience so whether it's digital or not like the, the expectation is the same on on both dimensions and makes great business sense to have colleagues who can are on the phone enjoying the experience with the customer as opposed to trying to struggle through the system and keep the customer engaged to that conversation. So it uh, totally makes sense. Um, the the Maybe the other piece would say, um, things will go wrong. And so have you enabled your team to be able to facilitate a discussion with a customer when things do go wrong, right? Sort of nature of technology, digital experiences that are built, trying to solve for many things, they, it's nature of it. And knowing that they have a process and an approach to having those conversations with customers is sort of key um, as opposed to expecting perfection out of technology which is sort of a, a bit of a mugs game as they might say um, so that would be be one piece for sure and and then sort of imbuing the value of the the human touch like so even when we see uh, the massive volume of customers who come through a process and do it you see disengagement at different points then you want to be able to leverage the your your colleagues to have conversations but you also much like you want to listen to all those customer verbatims and everything else that front line has all sorts of input to to give to you. you i mean you need to sort through it a bit and sort of find out what's perception versus what's reality like frequency is is and there's a whole selection issue of like all the problems go to the certain folks who, who who get those calls which sort of makes sense you, there's some math to making sure you're focusing on the right problems but I think having open ears and listening to all of those sort of the non-data inputs that are actually data, super important and you know, can't underemphasize the value of the, the colleague or uh, employee in that situation. Yeah, I love that. I love that comment. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lean, lean, lean Six Sigma guy. So uh, the concept of the Gemba walk, which is, which is kind of going down to the floor and, and speaking to your frontline people and, and spending time with them and kind of engaging with them. and you know, thinking about um, uh, a, a topic you, you, you've all mentioned this morning, which is um, company culture as well. I mean, you know, what, what better way to bring people on that journey around innovation um, than actually engaging with them and trying to problem solve with them and, and, and you know, fit, uh, figure these things out collectively. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for that. Um, we've got some questions coming in from the audience that I definitely want to get to those. Um, keep, keep, keep them coming. Um, Great one here from Tristan. Um, how do you keep clients in the digital channel from end to end uh, of their purchase and service experience, specifically when navigating product complexity of insurance? Um, Carrie, I'd like to share your thoughts on that. Um, that is, um, I, I think there, um, it's important to be mindful of what client experience are you looking to deliver in the digital channel? Because not all risks mm. are going to fit into that. And so um, keeping them in the digital channel end to end for everyone probably isn't realistic. So as soon as possible in that journey, really being able to help people identify, do they belong in that path or really do they need to go somewhere else because of the complexity of their 
their needs. If, if you can design that to be really at the beginning of the process, first of all, I think is important. For those clients that are kind of fit those criteria of, of moving through the, the digital experience, um, there, I think, especially, you know, as Tristan's noted, insurance is complex and it's, it's not intuitive. It's not something that, that people are necessarily familiar with. So um, being able to really use plain language, use consumable and understandable language, I think is critical um, in terms of people then feeling confident in the decision that they've made and also providing a, a lot of in-context help so that people, if they have a question, can access it within the digital experience so that they can continue to proceed through, you know, like, why are you asking this question even? Um, it is important information to provide to a client so that they are confident in the, the need for that information being shared, how it's going to be used, and then being able to, to make sure that they're um, proceeding through that experience in a way that will arrive at, at them purchasing the correct product. So I, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, a really a challenge to simplify the complex in the insurance industry and in the digital experience, it's particularly critical. Um, and, then, and then really providing that, that assistance. And I would also say trying to minimize the data points. Um, if people feel like they're having to go and, and look things up from, you know, their legal documents or um, the, it's information that they, they, aren't, they don't know or maybe aren't confident that they're giving an accurate answer, they'll disengage from that process as well. So reliable third-party data inputs, I think, are, are really important in that integration if, you, if you'd like a client to persist through that experience in a self-serve environment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um... Yeah, no, no, lots, lots of great observations there. Laura, um, obviously, you know, data is, is a key one for this, right? I mean, you know, being, being, being proactive perhaps with, with customer needs um, as, as opposed to being reactive. Um, what are your thoughts um, around that question? Yeah, I think, so at, first of all, I agree with Carrie, not 100% of insurance interactions can or should be 100% digital, right? There are times when it's just not appropriate and there are needs where, actually the needs are more complex and can't easily be built into something digital but if we focus on the ones where maybe those needs are a little simpler and 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 you can get that straight through processing I think there's a couple of things that um that can help having really good advice Carrie touched on that and then and also having digital chat available through so it's still in that digital in that digital journey maybe it's a chat bot maybe it's an actual person on the end because I think mm. you know, I think I think most organizations so far, if they're honest, have struggled to get chatbots to a point where they can deliver on most of what they want to do through that. They really need somebody on the end of a chat who's able to answer those questions. I think when we think about the advice, though, um, there's a couple of things I think are really important in terms of building that advice. Because and the reason I think that is because I think we make we often as insurers make an error where we we put digital advice and we go, that's perfectly clear now. I completely understand. Well, of course, I've been in the industry for 15 years. Very clear to me. The customer is like, no, I still have no clue what you're talking about. And so I think two ways we can get around that. Um, one is, um, Mark touched on this earlier, asking our frontline, like people who've been on the phone for 10 years talking to customers. What do you get asked? What do customers not understand about this question? How can we phrase it better? How do you explain what this question means when a customer asks to you? And then building that into the digital. And then secondly, it seems obvious, but it's missed so often asking customers, like literally just putting it in front of customers and seeing how they go through that process and seeing where they get stuck and what they don't understand. So I think that's all really important from a design perspective. And then the question you asked around data, I think can really start to inform this too, because if you can identify those parts in the journey where wait, like 30% of customers get stuck on this question and leave and call us, well, that's the point that we should focus on making better so data can start informing where you need to make improvements as well. Thanks, thanks Laura, brilliant. Um, uh, a, a question here um, which kind of speaks to perhaps another challenge uh, that, that, that companies might face when, when it comes to um, innovation and, 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 and so forth. Um, thinking about perhaps the, the, the corporate uh, culture, um, kind of you know, getting buy-in across the business. Um, how, do you, how do you get buy-in across the enterprise on the, on, on the dis discipline of, of, of using data and, and shifting away from legacy processes to perhaps a more digital uh, future? And, and um, 
Mark, I'll start with you on this one. Um, I would, uh, not an easy task. I think it's sort of maybe just to put a fine point on it. Um, and, and for all sorts of good reasons, which is it works. We've all got the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type thing. And it's very logical and, and, and rational in that. Um, I, I think in many cases, moving to data driven and thinking about these, you've hit on some points around, okay, if you're taking a customer perspective and you're doing a customer journey, and then you're laying that over top and you can see these legacy processes and way where they're in, they're hindering the client. Um, you can then see how it's a, a hindrance to your business and to delivering value. So it's, it's you, you've got to do some foundational work in that to say, okay, are we going to focus on the customer? If we are, what does that look like? How does the journey flow? And then well, how does our process align to the customer journey? Not our system mm -hmm. that we bought or our, the way that we've organized our teams or any of those things, how does the process align to the customer? Because they're at the end, they're the ones who sort of beholden to our process and or uh, like uh, Carrie was saying earlier, the front line. They are sort of the, the, the they're the bubble gum and duct tape over our internal processes. So I think it's, that's, that's sort of philosophically the piece and then winning, right? Like, so taking some, something clear that everybody agrees on, actually implementing the change doesn't have to be huge, can be relatively small. And those things create the effect. Um, yeah. and, and like I think those are the, maybe the two. Like you got to have a right pathway to say, am I fixing the right problems? Because they're a customer impacting, colleague impacting, and then you you got to pick a winner to start with and get rolling. As opposed to the the I think the nuance to whether it's building digital or anything, it's like I'm going to build everything and fix all the world's problems is yeah. is a dangerous way to do it because I mean, we know how those go, right? It's that's very hard. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, cheers, cheers, Mark. And yeah, I guess to to some extent, it's like any 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 technology, you know, kind of pick something, yeah, the the classic low hanging fruit thing, right, where it's going to have a, a an impact. Um, Carrie, what what are your thoughts there? Um, I completely agree with Mark. It's really powerful to be able to show success to really create buy in, and I I think it's also helpful to illustrate examples from other industries. Um, in this case, because I, I think sometimes it's hard to conceptualize what would that what would that look like and why would that be important to a, a client or why would that be important to me? And so uh, an obvious example would be something like Netflix, where, you know, people uh, go into Netflix in the in the evening and and they are being served up suggestions that are likely things that they want to watch. They enjoy that experience, and so why wouldn't our insurance clients enjoy that experience as well? If we are able to, you know, capture data and make recommendations, um, if we're able to really help them perform their roles more easily as well, I, I think that's a big selling point. Um, particularly in a, a brokerage, there are so many different insurance products to try to know the nuances of and. Um, it's, I feel like being an insurance broker is really a difficult job. You're taking a very complex product, a lot of different options, uh, maybe not a lot of patience for having a long conversation about it and really trying to understand your client's needs well, capture a lot of data points, recommend something that, that suits their needs and explain why that suits their needs in, in plain language. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult role. And so I think if we can look at how um, you know, data-driven recommendations or, or just having, you know, data integration, some of those, those um, really fairly obvious wins in the employee's journey and serving their clients. I think that can be a really powerful illustration as an example of, of what Mark was mentioning, where you can really show a win. Yeah, cheers. Cheers, Carrie. Um, super, super helpful. Um, Laura, you, you talked a little bit about cross-functional teams earlier and, you know, how, how critical, you know, having this kind of, you know, ship that's moving in this same direction instead of a bunch of little speedboats going off in different, different directions. Um, you know, that's, you know, thinking about the, 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 the buy-in from the top. I mean, that, that's, that's just essential, isn't it? To have a successful, um, kind of journey. Yeah, absolutely. You, you do need to have buy-in in terms of what it is that you're trying to achieve and really aligning around goals. I think actually, I, you know, rather than start with the trying to align everyone around data, actually trying to align everyone around what it is that you want to achieve as a business is probably an easier place to start. Mm. And then when you can show that data is helping you get towards that goal, 
then you're going to get that buy-in from data. To Mark's point, if you can find those small wins along the way and celebrate them, I think we don't always celebrate those successes enough, right? So, you know, find those successes where you have used data, it's delivered something um, which has delivered better outcomes for customers and better results for the organization and then share that really broadly. I think that can start to get that buy-in. But you're right, you do need that alignment, at least from your leadership team around like, what it is that you're trying to do and what it is that you want to deliver. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, a question from a, 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 a question from the audience here, and, and I'll, I'll throw this out to anybody um, who, who perhaps can shed some light on it. Um, uh, Carrie, you were just talking about the brokers and kind of, you know, helping them, supporting them with, with perhaps data and technology. Um, the question is, is how do insurers work um, effectively with, with brokers who perhaps already have their own uh, customer portals? Um, I think that data integration is really the bi-directional integration is, is really important there. And so being able to have access to the common data enables workflows, but also um, being able to really pull in that information into the portal so that it's accurate and complete. And I think in that case, you know, I'm, I'm on the broker side of the business, so I'll show a preference toward um, having it really be the broker portal where clients are going to. And part of the reason for that is the desire of, of clients to really see all of their business in one spot. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the case where maybe a broker hasn't placed the entire portfolio with the same carrier, the carrier's portal is going to give a, a slice of that information but it won't give the comprehensive view. And if you, you know, consider also that they may have personal lines, commercial lines, group, life, you know, all those different lines of business um, with the same broker, I, I feel like then it's really powerful for the broker to have a, a strong portal functionality and for those insurers to provide the APIs so that that, that information is always um, accurate and relevant. And then also to collaborate with brokers if there are features that they, they'd like to be able to highlight or you know offers that they'd like to be able to provide in a logged in state as well. So that partnership I think is really, really critical and the integration of the data is, is the, the most important aspect of that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, Mark, Laura, anything you might like to, to add there? I mean, I, I agree with what Carrie's saying. When we think about that uh, on the broker side, when you think about that relationship, that customer has that relationship with the broker. And so it's really important that, they, um, that they're interacting with that broker. I think where, where insurers are bringing um, pieces around the digital needs to be on, um, in that broker relationship needs to be around value add pieces. So, you know, if it's, for example, digital experiences that are going to help that customer make their claim quicker and easier and faster, right? The things that the insurer is going to be able to bring there Maybe it's telematics apps, for example, where the insurer is going to be able to share some of that data. I think, you know, those things are important for, for insurers to bring. It needs to always be, though, in collaboration with brokers and in partnership with brokers. It, it doesn't, it falls apart from a customer perspective. It falls apart for the customer if there's two completely separate things right, where, where those two organisations aren't, aren't working together in collaboration. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um... So a, a, a question here, uh, kind of an, uh, this, I mean, a, a fascinating question, which I think is, is increasingly um, kind of uh, uh, being discussed um, in, in, in the industry. Um, how, how important is uh, ethnographic research and its representation in data? Um, is it something being used for modeling currently around the customer journey and, and the launch of, of new products? Um, Carrie, I'll, I'll throw that over to you. Sure, I love this question. Thank you so much, Preet, for sending it in. Um, and personally, I love doing ethnographic research. It's, uh, and for anyone who's not familiar with, with what that means, it's um, really going out and, and talking to people about their experience and having uh, a more of an open discussion where your questions aren't necessarily leading, they're very open-ended to ask them about their thoughts and experiences in whatever context it is that you're trying to research. Um, so. I, I feel really strongly that it's a, a perfect complement to, and I think Mark had alluded to this before, is to, you know, you look at the, the data that you're, you're pulling in in a structured format, and then to really make sense of why that's happening or what the emotions are behind it or those, those um, human elements uh, that factor into how, pe how people's behaviors are influenced. It's really important to, to really go out and conduct that ethnographic research and 
generally it doesn't have to be a huge sample size in order to, to extract really relevant and um, powerful content. Um, but going out and, and speaking to those clients that are, are your target clients and understanding how it is that they, they experience that product or that service or what do they find frustrating, um, how do they feel about the, maybe the, the asset that they're trying to ensure, why is that important to them? Getting at some of those nuanced factors can really help to build in that, that extra layer of not just a utilitarian experience, but one that's actually emotionally resonant and, and really hits the mark as well as to inform the, the support structure that you put around that. So again, back to some of the you know, commonly asked questions or how could people understand certain concepts better? A lot of that really can be extracted through those conversations in ethnographic research in, a, I think, a more powerful way than, than looking at um, just the underlying data set. Although I, I do feel it's powerful, it's really critical, not just powerful, really critical to bring the two together so that you have that kind of that scale of it, um, view of it as well with, with the, the data aspect. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kerry. Really, really, really helpful insight there. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to kind of uh, creating a, a compassionate and, and empathetic experience, that, that's, that's a critical piece of it, right? Um, Laura, and anything you might like to add there? Yeah, I mean, everything Carrie said, I think is right in terms of the criticality of this and how much you can learn from it. I think you can, sometimes you can learn more from asking 10 people about their experience than you can learn from 10,000 data points, right? I think I think it's really powerful. I think one of the things that's interesting culturally and, and is probably the biggest challenge is being willing to change what you're doing based on what you hear. So sometimes mm. we can come up with what we think is a brilliant idea, right? And you take it and you start testing it particularly through this testing and you realize customers hate it and being okay with going like okay I got to change I got to do something different is um I think can be tough right when you when you thought you had something great and so that's the biggest challenge is not getting the input but being willing to really listen to it and you know if you've got 10 people who've told you something it really isn't serving their needs being willing to actually listen to that feedback back rather than find excuses yeah. as to why they're wrong and why they don't really understand right I think that's really important so coming to it with a really open attitude and being being actually far in fact it's a good th if they come to you and they say actually we really hate this like well good like at least you know it now then rather than before you launched it to, to the market right it being coming at it with that attitude i think is critical yeah no i totally agree with laura mark how how, how do organizations build that agility um so when they do you know when they do kind of receive information that that perhaps will will have a a heavy influence on, on the customer experience i mean how how do you create that organizational agility to 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 be able to respond and react quickly uh i i think it's the, it probably ties in nicely with what laura was saying there about the the not being beholden to your ideas and mm. um the uh, I mean, the, the joke about it is around like the business method is find all the data that proves that I'm right versus the scientific method, which is actually the opposite. And so it's, can you a create that culture and dynamic about it? And then that will actually facilitate being able to make the changes and be agile because you're not going to try and spend all your time defending why something you did didn't work. Right. So it's, so th th there's all the sort of fundamental things around being agile and st structuring teams and being able to do cross-functional and all of that. But at the end, if you spend more of your time debating the next step, it doesn't, you, you will have an agile team that delivers quickly, but it's going to take you too long to get to the point of making the decision to move forward or not with something. Um, so I think that might be, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in agile teams and how that works. Like, there's lots of people who are much more qualified, but I think the, the cultural element around decision-making yeah. is the key input, right? If you're about analysis and data and that and proving your point, then hard to do. If you're willing to accept that you're wrong or that, and, and Laura, the other one I was going to say, as you were saying that I, there's certainly ones where we, you know, you, you're proven wrong by your customers and you went and did it anyway. And then other ones where actually they were wrong and they were looking at it in the wrong context, but how do you design it in a way that it's not betting the business? And if you can't, then don't do it, right? Like it sort of depends yeah. on what it is. There was a, um, if, if it's a door you can walk back through, then that's a good, uh, I think it's a, a uh, we won't credit it to him, but anyway, so that it's a good theme around what doors can you not walk back through? Which ones can you, 
make sure that you put the right diligence to the ones you can't walk back through and then yeah. test the ones you can. If it, if it turns out you're wrong and you can walk it back, do it. Um, and, and equally to your point around agility, design it so that if you put it in and you're really wrong, you can take it back tomorrow, not three months from now. Yeah. No, and I think, um, no, no, you're right. And I think around decision making, right. I mean, if, 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 you know, I think another, perhaps another positive, um, um, uh, kind of behavioral thing that, that, that may have come out from, from the pandemic is companies had to react very quickly and perhaps before did not have the, the processes or infrastructure in place to do that. Whereas now perhaps some of those controls or some of those processes will, will, will be in place to, to enable that a bit more effectively. Um, we've got a few minutes left. We've got five minutes left on the clock. This is flying by. Um, there's a question here about blockchain. Um, of, of course, I'm going to um, expand on this a little bit and just say, talk about more broadly about technology and perhaps automation. Um, do you anticipate the industry, the insurance industry embracing blockchain plus other um, uh, automated technologies uh, to, to unlock more seamless digital experiences? Um, historically, insurance is, is, is fairly risk averse. So how, how do we get that balance between perhaps the more um, you know, risk averse approach, traditional approach, unless it's something that's much more innovative and, and, and exploratory in nature. Um, Carrie. Um, <laughs> I know this is a big topic. Um, it is. So, um, I'll maybe touch quite lightly on it. Um, I, I feel that um, there is a lot of, and I think Laura had alluded to this at the beginning or explicitly stated, There, there's a lot of there's a long path ahead in, in delivering digital experiences in the Canadian insurance industry. And so I think that um, certainly there's a lot of uh, research and interest into looking at how blockchain can really um, can really improve the process flow and reliability of data exchange in the insurance industry. Um, I think at the same time, there are a lot of building blocks and um, you know, progress for insur insurance entities to make probably before they feel like they need to get to that stage. So um, I, I think, you know, there's certainly a, a lot of innovation going on in that space. And, and um, so I, I, I appreciate those entities that are going out and testing that out and the, you know, reinsurance consortiums that are really testing out those use cases. And at some point that I think it will um, come back to be considered as being embedded in more mainstream insurance flows. But um, I think that it feels far, far away for a lot of, um, I'll just speak for, you know, for brokerage side and, and my previous experience on the carrier side. Um, it maybe feels a little bit further away in terms of the roadmap. But yeah. I'm really curious to hear what Laura has to say. <laughs> Laura. And, yeah, I, so I would say, you know, if I think about blockchain specifically, actually, do I think um, it will end up in the insurance industry? Yes, probably with a big but, I would say. And, <laughs> and the challenge I have around blockchain is, a lot of the conversations that, that I've heard around blockchain have been around how can we take this technology and use it in insurance? And yeah. I really think the conversation needs to be the other way. Like what are the insurance challenges we have and where is blockchain the best solution for that? And I think often we just, we're flipping those and trying to find use technology for technology's sake. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. The insurance industry should embrace technology and it should do it much more than it's done so in the past. And we need to be more open to those things. But I think we just have to be careful not to do it because it's the new cool technology um, and we should do it because it's actually solving a genuine problem for the industry and customers. I love it. I, I think that's I think that's a perfect way to wrap up this this panel, um, because as, as, a, as a technology guy, um, you know, the temptation is always is always to. Uh, you know, throw throw the coolest, shiniest objects at something, and, and and perhaps see see where it sticks. But obviously, um, you know, identifying what those what those problems are, and you know, as as you've talked about uh, fantastically today, kind of, you know, engaging engaging your your fellow um, teams around innovation and technology, and trying to figure out what those what those problems are, and perhaps how best to salute, uh, find a solution for them. Sometimes even blockchain isn't the answer to everything, right? Whereas um, there, there are multiple ways to look at it. At it. So um, to, to the panel, Mark, Curry, Laura, thank you so much for joining today. Um, really appreciated your insights. I, I, I think um, 
we, we could could have gone on for another hour. Um, this 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 was a great chat. Um, thank you to everybody attending for your questions um, and and sticking with us. Um, have a wonderful day.